Welcome back. So for this lecture, we all know that in Switzerland, psychedelic substances including LSD, psilocybin, and MDMA are being used in research and in clinical settings. But how can we know what is the best dose? How can we find the right dosage uh, to optimize the safety and the positive outcome for the patient and in the treatment? So to answer this question, this lecture called Dosing Psychedelic and Drug-Drug Interaction will present the acute effect characteristics of this substance and discuss the various factors that can influence uh, dosing and the possible interaction of medication and psychedelics. Our speaker is a professor of clinical pharmacology in and internal medicine at the University of Basel. He is the head of the psychopharmacology research group at the Department of Biomedicine. Back in time, we had Albert Hoffman. Now we have him and his team. He's also the scientific advisor for ABS Foundation. We are really grateful uh, to have him. A warm well welcome to Matthias Lichti. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with so many enthusiastic people. And I will talk about uh, dosing psychedelics, referring to uh, mostly in this talk, psilocybin, um, LSD and MDMA, thus the three psychedelics or substances that we can use currently in the limited use program in Switzerland. We will look at pharmacokinetics and concentration effect relationships, uh, then um, adjustment, whether needed, to, to the weight, or maybe females versus males, whether there are, there are adjustments needed, um, whether um, the different doses of the substances, uh, we look at the equivalents, what the different uh, doses mean in another substance, uh, pharmacogenetics, uh, whether there are genes influencing the effects, uh, set and setting, and a little bit of drug-drug interaction. So it's quite a lot. I hope to be done by 10 to 12, and then we would have 20 minutes until 10 past 12 um, for the discussion. So you see I'm Swiss German. I try then to stick <laughs> to, the, to the time. Okay. So we'll start with psilocybin, you know the substance, and we'll have a brief look at the doses that are being used in the bigger trials. So that would be a phase two study. Uh, they use 20 milligrams and 30 milligrams for 70 kilograms. So of course now it depends on how heavy these patients were, but let's assume these doses were about 20 and 30 milligrams. Plus, uh, most likely, or typically a small dose is used first and then a higher dose. So that is an approach that we would recommend also for the limited use programs of it, obviously. Uh, then another example, um, also study done in the UK. Um, here they used 25 milligrams, two doses in the treatment group. So the dose in between. 20 and 30, and it seems that they used an absolute dose, so not adjusted for um, the body weight. Then this is a company study, the biggest that we have, I would say, so far on psilocybin, the compost pathway study, so they again used 25. So it seems that these 25 are somewhat like the standard dose that is currently being used with psilocybin. Uh, note that the small dose, 10 milligrams, for example, was, didn't seem to be having a significant effect here. It has effects in between the placebo, um, which was a little bit of psilocybin, and then the high dose. And then maybe another one. Here, the first, that was the first dose, you, uh, the first study using higher doses. So they went up to 40 milligrams, and they had an, an, an interesting dosing method. They started with what we called like the, the regular dose, these 25 milligrams, and then only the ones, or most of them were then up uh, dosed to 40 milligrams, but uh, not the ones that already had a strong effect. So essentially it was adop ad adjusted to the response of the first dose. So very much like I would probably also do it in the limited treatment program. You start with a lower dose of 20 to 25, 
and then maybe you may go up in those not having a strong response um, and if somebody has already enough of course you stay with what you have but in a clinical study you have to decide at the beginning how you're going to do it and let's say if you decide if you decide to give 40 milligrams in everybody as the first dose then you're stuck you cannot change it during the study typically so you really it's, it's important how you select this as a researcher and in practice of course you may have a little bit uh, more freedom how you dose okay so how does that compare to the doses that we used in clinical trials in, uh, in, in healthy subjects here to describe the subjective effects? Um, here we used 15 and 30 milligrams of psilocybin, the red curves, and 100 and 200 micrograms of LSD. So you can see already that the 30 milligrams of psilocybin, which is already quite a high dose, still was a little bit lower than 200 micrograms of LSD. Whereas the higher dose that was used in this past, last study that I showed you, the 40 milligrams of psilocybin, would be equivalent to 200 micrograms of LSD. Um, this has not yet been tested, but we have compared 100 micrograms of LSD with 20 milligrams of psilocybin, and that would be equivalent. So. Um, between the 15 and the 30, 20 would be about here, similar to 100 micrograms of LSD. And this was compared in this study uh, within the same subject. So you really have a direct comparison of psilocybin and LSD effects. And you can also see that the psilocybin lasts shorter, higher doses last a little bit longer. That's, that's true for both substances. And then the LSD has a longer time of action and also longer half-life compared to the psilocybin. Um, maybe we can look at bad drug effects as well here. That's interesting. So there's little bad drug effects and the higher doses obviously have a little bit, they produce a little bit more anxiety compared to a low dose. Um, ego dissolution, for example, the typical effect of these substances, 200 micrograms of LSD produces more ego dissolution than 100, of course, and uh, the psilocybin is in between here, because 40 milligrams would be up here and 20 would be down here. Okay. Uh, how was the blinding in, these, in this specific study comparing psilocybin and LSD? It was very good between the psilocybin and the LSD, but bad compared to placebo, obviously. I mean, e almost everybody would uh, realize the difference from placebo. Uh, there was one guy who didn't, but otherwise, let's say, <laughs> high, maybe it was me, <laughs> high dose, of LSD can be um, mistaken as a lower dose, for example, or as a high dose of psilocybin. So this statistically, there is no, you, you cannot tell whether you have psilocybin or LSD when you're on the peak. That's what this means. So all these psychonauts telling us, well, that's very different. Not if you're, if you're testing it in a double blind controlled study. You cannot distinguish. And about maybe half of these guys were experienced and half were novel view, um, uh, yeah, novices. Then uh, some optic effects. Are there any other differences? If you cannot tell the difference between LSD and psilocybin at the peak, you may be able to tell the difference uh, due to the, to the length of the, of the effect, right? But even this in this study, uh, people could not distinguish between LSD and psilocybin bis despite the LSD effect being longer. So those who really knew uh, that LSD has a longer effect, they should have uh, distinguished the two. So what uh, can we say about the somatic changes? So you can see here that the mean arterial blood pressure is higher with psilocybin, the high dose, compared to LSD, although subjectively LSD had greater effects. So uh, psilocybin produces a higher blood pressure if standardized for the subjective response, even, or even here, yeah, you can see, um, psilocybin produces a high blood pressure. 
you could argue, well, LSD is safer. It's not, not cardiovascularly. However, let's check for the pulse. It's the opposite. Um, LSD produces a higher pulse rate than uh, psilocybin. And then if you want to kind of know the overall stimulation of the body, you can kind of just multiply the heart rate with the blood pressure and you get the rate pressure product and that is about similar or a little bit higher for LSD, but the LSD dose was also relatively higher than the psilocybin dose. So overall, the stimulation of the body, the somatic, the, the somatic, uh, uh, or you could say the uh, sympathetic effect is comparable for these two substances. Other differences, maybe there are other differences. So far, I would argue it's quite similar. The body temperature, here we have a higher increase with psilocybin. We don't know why, maybe it's the psilocybin acts a little bit on the serotonin transporter and maybe there is a little bit more serotonin release compared to the LSD. But that with a lower dose, you could say, than the LSD, we get a higher increase in body temperature. It's not dangerous, but it's interesting to know or to note. Um, adverse effects, no difference. You cannot read it, but there is no difference between LSD and psilocybin, headaches and uh, nausea and all these things. It's just more or less the same. So these are the equivalent doses. 100 micrograms of LSD would be 20 milligrams of psilocybin. This is the Bogenschutz dose used in the alcohol study just published, and that would be the LSD dose just used by us in uh, patients with anxiety disorder, and these will be equivalent. So at this the moment, so this is the most frequently used dose with psilocybin, and this dose currently is not being used. So there's no direct equivalent, you could argue, for, for this dose. Okay, should you sh stop the antidepressant when you have a treatment with psilocybin? That's important in the limited use program because patients on depression may have an SSRI and then you want to give psilocybin. And in the past, it was argued that you should stop the uh, SSRI because otherwise the, the effects of psilocybin would be um, diminished or, or completely gone. That was the view. So we tested in healthy subjects, not in patients yet in our lab, uh, whether a pre-administration of an SSRI, which is uh, escitalopram, which is commonly used in Switzerland, whether an escitalopram given for two weeks, uh, which is then a standard dose or actually quite a high dose already. Uh, so these were healthy subjects taking an antidepressant. And uh, we then gave the psilocybin and you can see the blue curve, it's, it's slightly lower than the black one, but this is far from being significant. It's still essentially the same. Um, if you give psilocybin after citalopram compared to placebo, so it's roughly the same with regards to the good effects. However, the bad drug effects are interestingly significantly lower. They're still very low, but they're even lower if you have an SSRI before. Fear is also uh, slightly lower. So if anything, it's actually better. You should actually keep on the, the antidepressant. And um, the arterial blood pressure is also lower if you have the combination. The heart rate is lower. So we have learned we have to look at both, but both is lower. So less cardiovascular stimulation. And body temperature, no more increase. So it increases. We, we learned that just uh, before. And it increases the same if you have an SSRI. So there, hyperthermia should, could be one sign of, of too much serotonin, like of a serotonin syndrome. And this is certainly not the case. There's also no other signs of serotonin syndrome like, uh, or serotonin toxicity, like rigidity or tremor or, or hyper uh, uh, too, much, too, too strong reflexes or something like this. And then in the 5D AST scale, so the psychedelic uh, rating scale, a decrease in anxiety if you combine the SSRI with psilocybin, so that's consistent with what I showed you already, a decrease in anxiety, but no decrease, no change whatsoever in oceanic boundlessness. So that's what you want, right? 
that's what you want. We haven't tested it in patients. Compost did a small study, and it seems that you most likely can keep on the SSRI. And that's what we are currently suggesting to the practitioners in the limited use program. So to summarize, dosing aspects for psilocybin, um, starting dose, maybe 20 already. You can also start with 15, but 20 should be okay, 25. A high dose, I would say 30 to 40 milligrams is already quite a high dose. Um, the equivalent, 20 milligrams of psilocybin is 100 micrograms of LSD base. So that's the base, not the tartrate. Tartrate would be 146 micrograms, um, would be the equivalent to this. Then no adjustment to sex, that meaning that we had the same effects in all our studies with actually with LSD and psilocybin in females and males. So there's no need to adjust. There's no need to adjust to body weight. I haven't shown you this data, but we don't see that body weight has an influence on the effects or even the pharmacokinetics or anything at the doses that we, are be, uh, that we use and at the body weight differences that we have in, 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 in Switzerland. So males are about 20, uh, on average, males are 20% heavier than females, but you know, maybe in another country the gap. I would say US people are overall more heavy, but males and females. So uh, probably um, the difference wouldn't be uh, bigger. We have no genetic information for psilocybin dosing. Um, that's just missing. Um, I would suggest not to pause the SSRI. I would probably stop or pause antidepressants that have a known effect uh, on, on blocking the 5-HD2A receptor, like trazodone. There are a few uh, antidepressants that essentially block the receptor where the psilocybin should act on. So it may be wise to stop them, but it hasn't been really tested in clinical studies. Uh, we don't stop opioids and sedatives because of withdrawal syndromes. Um, that's about it for the psilocybin. So let's move to LSD, which also is being used in Switzerland in the limited use programs and in clinical studies. And what, what was a dose that has been used? An example here, 200 micrograms, very high dose, equivalent to 40 micrograms of milligrams of uh, psilocybin. And note that this was used as first dose in many patients that have had no experience with this substance. And just from these four or five years uh, this study was running, uh, we would say, or the therapist would probably agree, that this is rather a high dose to start. So we would, if, if I had to redo this study, I would start with 100, see how it goes, and then move to 200 with the second dose, similar to the Bogenschutz approach, probably. And the current study with depressed patients is actually using this design, 100 or 200, but we don't start with 200. Okay, uh, results, we are not focusing on this. Maybe briefly, um, the positive effects are linked to the long-term outcome, months after the acute sessions, whereas the negative effects are not, and the mystical experiences are, so this has been shown by many, and it just highlights that we should aim for positive effects acutely, I guess. I'm not saying that, I mean, maybe this is a mediator of the, so maybe this is the cause of the long-term effects, but you could also just see it as something like a biomarker. There's something going on, we don't know, maybe neurogeneration in the brain or something, and the positive effects seem to be a mirror of this or a marker, and we can optimize this in the treatment, in the acute treatment, and can potentially then expect better outcomes because this is strongly correlated. So when we do studies in healthy subjects, we would argue we can already contribute a little bit to the later therapeutic use because we can, for example, uh, look what those would be optimal to produce the best positive acute effects. So, um, Frederike has done this for LSD. So we started, or we actually had a randomized trial where 
16 subjects got any of these different doses here. So they didn't know whether the first dose would be 200 or 25 or placebo. It was balanced, but each subject got all of them, right? And then you see here the plasma concentrations. So this is, is kind of proportional. If you double the dose, you get doubling in the plasma concentrations. But that's not the case for the effects. So good drug effects, a low dose, if you double the dose, you would get double the effects in the low dose range. And then if you go up from 50 to 100, it's still no, almost doubling, not fully. But then you can see that the good drug effects do not further increase if you, if you go up from 100 to 200. So maybe it's not really needed to go as high. This could be discussed because there are some effects like ego dissolution. So if you're uh, postulating, I want ego dissolution in my subjects because this is very typical for, for psychedelics. If you think this is needed to a high extent, then you would have to go up with the dose. And we did not test 150, so it could potentially be that uh, it's a, it could even be that the good drug effects go down again with 200. So that in that was not tested. But just from this data, you would argue there could be a plateau effect for good drug effects, but not for anxiety. So the anxiety is increasing, right? So. Maybe a hundred. I will, but if I just had this data, I would probably select a hundred micrograms as my uh, future treatment dose. But it could also be a little bit higher, 125, the equivalent of 25 milligrams of uh, psilocybin, or even 150. So this is again the the dose response, and here we have the addition as well of the ketanserine which is the blocking of the receptor. So ketanserin blocks the 5-HT2A receptor, and we gave it before the LSD. So the receptor was, you could argue, blocked. And then we gave LSD. And the black curve is kind of similar uh, to 25 micrograms. But they had plasma concentrations in the body of LSD that were similar to the blue and violet curve. So this that receptor blocking really takes away the entire LSD response. And there is, from this data, there is no dopamine effect of LSD, not at the receptor, not at the, DA, the, the D2 receptor or somewhere else, because all the effects are essentially blunted. There can still be dopamine, but potentially as a, res a result from the activation of the 5-HD2A receptor, of course. And then what if you give the ketanserin after the LSD? That was done here. Pl uh, LSD first, or LSD alone, would be this curve in terms of acute effects lasting 12 hours. And for those who want to treat patients and uh, just for like six hours, like for psilocybin or MDMA, you would administer the ketamine, maybe uh, the ketanserin, sorry, the ketanserin, uh, well, maybe after two or three hours, and then uh, you can shake hands after six hours and the patient goes. In this case, we gave it one hour after the LSD, so the trip lasts even shorter than with MDMA or uh, psilocybin. Or you could say somebody who's not, who is not feeling well, here, up here, and you want to abort this experience instead of giving benzodiazepines or, 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 uh, or olanzapine or something like this, you could give a or two ketonsurin capsules and again, uh, you will be down, and essentially they're almost normal back down here. So it really can be used to shorten or to a kind of abort a uh, trip experience. Even if you just have this in your cabinet as a practitioner, you may not never use it. It may be comforting for you and the patient to know that there, this option may be available if at all needed. Uh, so this should be made available to the practitioners in Switzerland again uh, soon. So they just uh, 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 they once got uh, this rescue treatment a few years ago, and uh, now that it will be made available again uh, for future treatments. Okay. So what about uh, genetics in the LSD uh, in the LSD subjects? Uh, let's go back here. So there is some variance. Hmm. 
There is some variance with the plasma concentration and obviously then also with the effect. So these are curves, plasma concentration curves over time and then the effects. You see the variance, like anxiety, some have, most have no anxiety, but some have quite some anxiety, and that is the mean that we are usually showing. So here you also see what's, what's kind of usually not shown. So not everybody has like 18% anxiety, but most are quite happy, but some not so happy, right? So this is usually not shown in the slides. So, um, but there's some variance, and this is not more than with any other medication. So if you tell me, oh, these are so unpredictable, these psychedelics, uh, you never know what happens. Well, that's true uh, to some extent for the effects, but still, I mean, if we give painkillers, it doesn't look different. Uh, medications are, it's, it's a fact, it's, they're not predictable. If you give antidepressants, a third of your patients will respond and, and two thirds will not respond. So what about predictable? It's not predictable. So psychedelics are not so, so unique pharmacologically as you may think, uh, maybe, or as we may be thinking in our community. <coughs> um, but there still is individual difference even for the pharmacokinetics, so for the availability of the substance in the blood. So we looked at the enzyme that's degrading, or one of the enzymes that is in, in involved in the degrading of LSD, Potentially, it has been shown in vitro, so it, it may be playing a role. And this was genotyped, and there are 2D6, cytochrome 2D6, non-functional people. These are poor metabolizers or, uh, yeah, just poor metabolizers. And the others are um, extensive metabolizer, intermediate metabolizers, ultra-rapid metabolizer, just everything, uh, everything else. And you can see that those who have um, a non-functional cytochrome 2D6, they get higher plasma concentrations compared to the others. It's only uh, seven subjects among um, 81, so still more data needed for genetics, but there is some indication that this is relevant. Now, um, dosing recommendations for LSD before we move to MDMA in the last 10 minutes. Linear pharmacokinetics, so if you double the dose, double the concentration in the blood. Close concentration effect relationship, we will see this in the next slide. Uh, you may have a plateau for positive effects, no adjustment for weights, similar to psilocybin. No difference between men and women. Uh, so we include 50% uh, male, 50% female in our studies. So it's not a a, a, a uh, how was it called, a s strange sample. We, so, and it, so it's diverse. We also include rich white women. <laughs> and then no, no difference between experienced and non-experienced persons. That's another dogma. Essentially, if you're experienced, then it's completely different, right? If you are a novice, yeah. Not, not, not statistically, not in our sample. Maybe our sample is unique in some sense. Maybe, of course it is. Uh, but we don't see a difference. Possible influence of 2D6. Um, in terms of interactions, you would not want to give antipsychotics, trazodone, maybe mirtazapine, the antidepressants that block the 5 receptor. And we don't know whether you have to pause the, uh, the, ser the antidepressants. Probably not, but it hasn't been tested yet. It will be test. It has started to be tested already. So the study is running, exploring exp exactly this. So we have a lot. So we have uh, a few more minutes then for MDMA. First of all, cardiovascular effects of LSD compared to MDMA. That's another thing. So in elderly, maybe MDMA has quite strong. Uh, stimulant properties here on the vascular system, you can see that, let's say here, almost 40% have a blood pressure systolic above 160, and with LSD it's less than 10%, so that's certainly safer cardiovascularly. Uh, the heart rate is going up in a third, it's a, a little bit more closer, but still MDMA is clearly more stimulant, body temperature goes up in all the subjects. So if you have really older persons, 80 or something, and maybe even a cardiovascular disorder, 
you can still give LSD. It also has empathogenic pr properties. It's, it's, uh, of course, it's different from MDMA, but cardiovascularly, it's, it's safer. So I would rather give uh, LSD in elderly people, and that is how it's, it's used in Switzerland. If you have older people in the compassionate use program, the limited use program, they will rather get LSD than uh, pre preferably over uh, MDMA. Okay, uh, dosing recommendations, we would start with 100 and then move up to 200 or 150 could be good. No dose adjustment, sex weight, uh, less risky compared to MDMA in older people, and now we are with MDMA. Um, so let's look at the concentration over time. This is LSD concentration over time. This is the LSD effect over, over time. So it's very similar, the two. Meaning, if you have LSD in the body, in the blood, in the brain, there is an effect. If it's gone, there's no more effect, right? It's very closely linked within an individual. There can be differences between individuals, but if I'm looking at one individual, if, if his concentration is, is kind of doubling or, or goes down, the effects will do the same. Very close. Not for MDMA. So if we plot the concentration against the effects, for LSD, this is essentially a line or an EMOX relationship. So it's a li slightly bent curve here. For MDMA, it's completely different because MDMA is not acting on a receptor and then it's kind of turning the brain on. It's releasing endogenous serotonin. And so there is a second mechanism. If the serotonin is released, at some point there is no more MDMA effect. And you can see this here. If you give MDMA, after 40, 60 minutes, you're already on the peak uh, with the effects. And the effects, I mean, this is the mean of several subjects, of course. It may be different from individual to individual, but the curve's always the same. After an hour, they're, al they're already on a, a short plateau or on the peak, and then it goes down, and after four hours, essentially, the effects are gone. But the plasma concentration of MDMA is, is still at, at its peak, and the half-life is eight hours. So there is essentially, if I have a blood concentration of a subject of 200, it can be that this guy is already back to normal, or it or he may still be fully tripping, right? There is, this is acute tolerance. And that is why I, I sometimes say, I don't see the need for additional dosing of MDMA. It will do something, maybe on some other receptors, adverse effects, put some more dopamine into the serotonergic terminals. There can be additional actions, but I'm not so sure whether this is really needed because there is already a lot of, to of, of MDMA in the body. So this needs to be clarified in the future. As you know, MAPS and many use 120 milligrams of MDMA and then another 60 after two hours. Why? So, weight adjustment, dosing, sex differences, that is now different from, MDMA is different from the psychedelics, not only regarding its effects, also pharmacologically. Luckily, so otherwise we have to stop here because it's boring, but MDMA is different. So we plotted different predictors against a range of acute effects in two, roughly 200 subjects, half of them females, and looked at the influence of these different variables. And whenever something is red or highly uh, dark or violet, there is strong influence. So overall, you can see there is a lot of red up here. What's this? MDMA plasma concentration. So the MDMA plasma concentration determines essentially what happens. And only then you have genetics and a lot of psychology and things, but it's not really mattering as long as you don't account for the dose that you give. The dose matters most, you could argue. So if you have, you, the dose matters, but also the body weight. Now, if we adjust, if we kind of remove the body weight, or let's go back maybe here. Um, so female also matters. So it also matters whether you are a female 
or a male, and the body weight. Both are um, predictors of the effect. Now, if we remove the body weight, if we normalize for the body weight or account for it in the analysis as a covariate, then it does not matter whether you are a female or a male. So that means it's just the difference in body weight between females and males, which makes that the females have a stronger effect. It's not that their brains are more sensitive. Of course they are, but not to MDMA. <laughs> Cytochrome 2D6 again, the same as with LSD. It if we go back, if we do not account for these kinetic things like body weight uh, and concentration and things, genetics do not matter. There's no individual difference in the plasma concentration statistically if you don't correct for body weight, for example. However, if you do, if you already remove kind of these important predictors, you could say, then 2D6 matters. And let's just see whether we already have this here. So if you are a poor metabolizer, same story as for LSD, if you're a poor metabolizer, your plasma concentration of the MDMA goes up higher and faster. Not, then it will be this more or less similar. So what's happening here after two hours? So there is only a difference in the first two hours, you could say. Also, drug liking goes dramatically up, but then it will be kind of similar. Same for the blood pressure. So, oft, so MDMA is an inhibitor of 2D6. So it takes two hours, and then this, this, this effect has taken place, and MDMA has essentially turned everybody who takes it into a poor metabolizer. If you're genetically a poor metabolizer, not much changes. But if you're a normal metabolizer, you will become a poor metabolizer for the next 10 days due to the MDMA. And this can even be seen here, because after two hours, Essentially, the curves are similar. It's only at the beginning where there is actually a genetic and, and functional difference in this enzyme where you can see the differences. But still, you could argue, wow, somebody who is a poor metabolizer, they will essentially jump up with MDMA, like with cocaine. They will like it, right? So mm, that could be a predictor again for, for abuse, so, for example. That has been speculated. Yeah. You may adjust the dose. That's the story here. So let's um, complete within the next two minutes, because I'm Swiss German, as I told you at the beginning. H produces a little bit lower heart rate increases with MDMA than uh, eight older people compared to younger, but not very spec uh, spectacular. So regarding dosing, sex plays a role, but only regarding the, the, the weight difference. So you would potentially dose 125 or 120 in male and maybe only 100 in women. Then you would have the same plasma concentrations. If you give 125 or 120 in women also, then you could actually also go higher in males uh, to 150 maybe. Um, then no sex difference if you already adjust to weight. So you can, al you can also say, I'm just giving higher doses to the heavier people, whether they're women or males, I don't uh, care. And don't adjust then for, for uh, sex. Uh, 2D6 has a small influence. And so these would be recommendations uh, for dosing based on uh, sex or uh, weight as we said. And now, very briefly, for the psychology. Yes, there is some psychology if you adjust first for the plasma concentrations. So somebody who is open, absorption, openness to new experiences, will have a nicer trip. Somebody who is more extroverted and well at the beginning of the experience. We measure this like when they come to the lab, they will be asked uh, on a, with an objective mood rating scale how they feel. And if they feel better, they will have a, ten a tendency to have also a nicer MDMA experience. And vice versa, if you are a little bit depressed, I mean not clinically, but a little bit, there will be more bad drug effects. So that's the, the setting variable, and the openness would be the set. So both have an influence on the MDMA response. Uh, that's just the summary. Briefly, interactions. If we give an SSRI, the effects of MDMA are dramatically reduced, shown here. This is even with duloxetine and SNRI. 
uh, also blocking the serotonin and the noradrenaline transporter, MDMA effect, and with duloxetine, the MDMA effect is gone. So what I said for the antidepressants for psilocybin is true for psilocybin, not for MDMA. Here you have to stop the antidepressant for roughly a week or even more to get a uh, full subjective response, which we would advise to do, uh, so we would advise to stop. Okay, we have looked at the cardiovascular safety already, comparing with LSD. These are the current uh, dose units in the compassionate use program. MDMA is provided in capsule of 25 milligrams, psilocybin in capsule of 5 milligrams, LSD uh, in solutions of 125, and there's also 10 for uh, potential microdosing. Um, and I think we are done. I'm skipping this and we are moving to the promised discussion starting at 10 past noon, uh, 10 to noon. Okay, thank you for the attention. And we start with the questions. So just start taking over here. There should be mics or somebody, well, somebody else has to take the responsibility for. Hi. Uh, so there. Oh. Just Should start. I continue? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. go ahead. Uh, thanks for your very interesting talk, first of all. Um, you mentioned the possibility of administering ketanserin to block the serotonin receptors and then thus um, stop basically the, um, the LSD effect. Um, definitely I won't argue with the logic that it um, would be useful for therapists to have this tool as an option. But I was asking myself the question, as you mentioned, uh, there was no correlation between bad drug effects and um, the there was an effect of good drug effects and the healing benefits, but not of bad drug effects. Um, so I was wondering myself if a patient is experiencing a challenging trip and then knows of the possibility to stop it with cantanserin um, and then actually stops the trip while it still feels bad, if it might actually decrease the benefits that would still result from the um, challenging trip even though there are bad drug effects. Um, that would be the first question, and um, nested in that would be the second question, if it would be then um, recommended to even tell the patient about this option before the trip. Thank you. My answer is I don't know. You have to test it. <laughs> Next question. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk uh, about the combination of escitalopram and psilocybin. If I understood correctly, you only gave escitalopram one time. So are these Two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Um, but are these findings still applicable if one uh, says in some cases the effects for escitalopram uh, only occur after maybe four weeks or three weeks? Yes, after. so you're right. We dose only two weeks. We had the same plasma concentrations as you would have with a continuous uh, dosing of citalopram. However, you could argue that some of the receptor ad adjustments or adaptations have not yet taken place. So with regards to safety, we can say... Um, Having a citalopram in the blood like a patient is not harmful for the psilocybin trip and we would say it's safe. But we cannot exclude that patients who have a citalopram treatment for weeks, uh, like say six weeks or even longer, would have any uh, changes in the receptor profile which would then decrease the psilocybin effect. So the, the, the new study now will be with LSD, first of all. Well, it's already changed from psilocybin to LSD, and we will pre-treat for six weeks. And then, typically, well, the argument would be any receptor adjustments would maybe not occur after two weeks, so that's a, a serious limitation of this study that we did, exactly. 
Um, <clears throat> yes. So catanserin is, of course, an antihypertensive. Yeah. So I was wondering if some of the rec rescue effects that you presented could be due to uh, anti uh, um, hyper. Well, uh, uh, sure. Yeah. The rescue effects on the blood pressure sy are due mi to not the psychological one. So no, not the psycho may, may I just finish? Sorry, I was looking for the word sympathomimetic effects could be blocked a la Damasio, you know, somatic marker, and if so, could uh, propranolol or other beta blockers serve as prophylaxis to avoid uh, part of the uh, risk of uh, negative effects? I mean, the negative, there are no, uh, I mean, a beta blocker can be used to potentially reduce the cardiovascular effects that are not there with LSD, um, so no need to do that. They will probably not interfere with the psychedelic experience, I agree. But the ketanser, the use of ketanserin is really to abort uh, bad psychedelic experiences, if anything. And of course, we want also wanted to show that you can displace the LSD from the receptors because others have t have said that this is not possible and so on. But um, no, I see a role for beta blocker combining with maybe MDMA. So if you combine carbidilol with MDMA, with MDMA, you still get the full psychedelic, uh, the full MDMA effects but less cardiovascular and hyperthermic or thermogenic effects. Uh, it hasn't been done to my knowledge. Yes, it has been done. So Pindalol was once combined with DMT, but it's a strange study by Strassman, uh, an old one that has to be replicated. Uh, so it enhanced the effects of, L uh, of LSD at the time. But currently I couldn't think of a, a, you know, a, a really a direct benefit. On the other hand, I would, if somebody has a beta blocker, we would not stop it before an LSD experienced, I guess. Yeah. Maybe Ben, the MDMA specialist in the roof needs the room needs to be considered. <laughs> I'm completely terrified in your present presence, actually. Of course, um, me too. And I'm, it's, it's, and I'm, it's vice versa. I'm really glad you, yeah. you will have left by the time I talk this afternoon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, so, you know, I, I, that in the, the graph of the acute uh, tolerant effects of MDMA mm. is really, really interesting. Mm. That uh, even as the dose goes up, the blood concentration remains the same, even though uh, as time passes. And you mentioned, you know, what's the point of taking the booster and... In our study, we gave the two-hour booster. All of MAPS gives boosters. And I guess the question is, objectively, they do appear to work. The patient has a improved, uh, length, longer session. Uh, they say they feel the drug effects again coming back on. It looks just like the first two hours, but for another two hours. So what do you think is going on if the blood concentration is remaining the same? I don't know. We need to we need to test it because neither maps nor anybody else has tested it. I, I think there was a study twice 100 in a space by four hours. But I mean the the the, the testing would be maybe 120 against in the same subjects and blinded uh, 120 plus the 60 given two hours later and then see how much is the prolong can they really distinguish in a double blind manner. Uh, how how much is the prolongation of the of the MDMA response? And we, let's just let's just agree upon that it's not yet clear. But I fully agree. Uh, since since the phase two and three studies are being done with this specific regime, that will probably be the regime then used for the for the market access. Uh, there, it's how it is. But there is a question mark, especially considering old reviews that too much MDMA at some point and too well, too much acutely and too many times can also be neurotoxic. So why are we are we boosting something that's potentially at some point also dangerous? So it's it remains an open question, I would argue. Yeah. Uh, from here. Thank you, Matthias, for your uh, you nice speech. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in the 70s, they were giving Grove and these companies 500, 600, 800 micrograms of LSD. Why don't we, or why don't you, uh, examine these high doses at uh, this way? Good question, good question. We, we are looking for volunteers still for the high doses. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 200 micrograms that we used is equivalent to almost 300, because we use LSD base so far. Now we're changing to tartrate. But the dose is expressed as the base content. 
and there is always tartrate then combined, right? And the tartrate, the dosing by Stanislav Grove was referring to the LSD tartrate, the amount, the total amount you could say with the, the salt. And so 200 would be equivalent to 300 micrograms of LSD tartrate. Additionally, we don't really, I mean, we can assume that this was done correctly in the 60s, 70s, but still, um, we know that if you have an IS LSD vial uh, on your on your shelf or or on or close to a window, and the the sun's there, and and within hours, this there's nothing more, no, no more LSD in it, right? So. Uh, with also this is an issue for microdosing for all the uncontrolled use of these substances. Uh, <laughs> if it's not a controlled experiment, we don't know the actual dose that was really given. Even we ourselves, we did the first study with LSD capsules, 200 microgram. Peter Gosser, his first anxiety study, the first clinical study with LSD after 40 years in patients in Switzerland by Peter Gosser. They used 200 micrograms of LSD in capsules, and that was the reason why we also gave it then 200 micrograms in <coughs> in uh, in uh, vials. So, and then when the study started, Peter told me that's much stronger. You 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 gave us too much. That's that's like much more than we had with the old study. And I said, no, no, the old capsules they were just they were rotten. <laughs> we we took no uh, true. We took the capsules and analyzed them, and it's just not true. It was much less. So on average, there was just 70 micrograms in a 100 microgram capsule, but some had only 20, and yeah. So it means, even in science, we are doing things wrong. We publish this also, because if you're doing a meta-analysis of the work on LSD, you would have to correct all, 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 our, all, all our older studies because the dosing isn't right. And uh, that is because the medication, so if you're a researcher, make sure that the doses that you're using are actually what you think they are. And too often they, they have no clue, even the researchers. So that is the difference now with pharmaceutical companies coming in. Now it's getting a little bit tougher and you have to, when we produce LSD for, for a study, we, 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 we kind of have to, more than we use in the study is going into testing, f whether it's stable, whether it's really what we say in terms of, of content uniformity of the vials. We have to store it for years to show that it's still stable at different, uh, like room temperature, fridge, and so on. So, yeah, that was not the question. Next question. <laughs> um, hi, Matthias. Thank you very much for the very wonderful and insightful talk. Me being a neuroscientist, um, I've got a question considering the drug-drug interaction. So you have mentioned that when you give people psilocybin and um, at the same time SSRI, then the negative effects of psilocybin can be reduced. And I know, for example, because I've been working with esketamine for Johnson Johnson, I know they recommend to also give an SSRI because yes. actually they have shown that even if you... Like when you give uh, esketamine without um, SSRIs, it doesn't actually work that well. It has been shown in mouse studies. So I was wondering, again, being a neuroscientist, what are the molecular mechanism, the neurological mechanism, which is underlying this effect? And second, also, what exactly, what kind of bad effects are being reduced? Yeah. Thank you. So we saw a reduction in anxiety, which is essentially the bad drug effect. It's not like nausea or something like this. And a hypothesis would simply be that SSRIs are anxiolytic. They are used as anxiolytics as well. I mean, not like benzodiazepines, but in, in anxiety patients. And potentially having that on board already produces a more positive psilocybin response. So it may actually be indeed the opposite of what we thought, that it could actually even be good. So there's two, two things. First, it's anxiolytic and apparently even in healthy subjects improves the, the psilocybin response. And secondly, since we know that you want to be feeling well before you go on a psychedelic journey or trip or whatever, 
you you don't want to be on on SSRI withdrawal because this is not really fun. So it, it, there's two reasons not to stop the SSRI, and it uh, it's it's kind of always amazing why this is not uh, tested before we are going into phase three. Well, you could argue Compass now did it with some mini study, and it will be interesting. I would probably recommend to include. Um, any patient who has an SSRI in phase three with psilocybin and just keep them on the SSRI and not stop it. And then you can still at the end look at how did they do compared to those who did not have an SSRI. But the dogma was you need to stop it. You need, and, and then it's, the, it's the, 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 pharma, the, the pharma company reasoning. We need clear, precise, uh, defined uh, population with defined uh, entry points and things, but it's kind of stupid. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for this very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering if the cardiovascular effects of the psychedelics depend on the psychological experience. Uh, that means, was, was it yet studied to uh, see what happens, for example, with unconscious subjects if you give psychedelics to them? Is there still cardiovascular effects or depends does it depend on yeah. anxiousness and you know like psychological yeah, so the effects? What's the egg and the, what's the, the the chicken? Essentially, maybe somebody has no, yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody has maybe a a challenging and in impressive um, subjective effect. Maybe the blood pressure is going up because of this, and this is very difficult to to disentangle. So one approach could be we could look at the entire data set and look whether, for example, people who had more anxiety also have a higher blood pressure, for example, or who had, or whether people, well, if you just look at whether who somebody ha who has a strong drug effect has a higher blood pressure, probably yes, but it's, it's still not sure that it's a psychology that produces the increase. So, but another response to this question, yes, I would argue that the, the psychedelics increase a little bit blood pressure because they are 5-HD2A is, is close to alpha-1. There is some cross, uh, let's say, activation and LSD, for example, is also an alpha-1 uh, agonist. And even if you purely stimulate 5-HD2A, you get a vasoconstriction, or the, the smooth muscles are constricting, meaning that the resistance in the vasculature goes up and blood pressure goes up. And it, going back to the question of ketonserine, ketonserine is a 5-HD2 antagonist and alpha-1 and alpha antagonist, because they're kind of interlinked. And it lowers blood pressure by reducing vascular resist, uh, resistance. So essentially, these substances would, it's, it's my, uh, uh, also ergotamine, uh, this is, these are substances to stop bleeding and in, in, in things. So these are what ways of constricting substances. Antonius Feuer, like uh, the, the initial, uh, the, the, the ergotamines, uh, the contamination of the, of the, in the, in the bread in the Middle Age, reproducing uh, um, problems with peripheral um, durchblutung, circulation. Yeah, so I would argue these are direct pharmacological effects, mostly. Yeah. So, uh, one minute. <laughs> Okay. Well, there is a next speaker, and he has the rights to his hour. We'll, eat, we'll already go late to lunch. Last question. Um, yeah. Hi, thank you for your very comprehensive and interesting talk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> thank you, Matthias, for your very uh, comprehensive and interesting talk this morning. Um, I have two so quick questions. One of them, um, the beginning of the talk, you mentioned the studies on psilocybin. And you mentioned throughout the talk um, about... Variatic, um, variations in um, pharmacokinetics with, with people and particularly with the cytochrome D6. Um, I was wondering if there is a reason why um, psilocin wasn't given instead of psilocybin and did that affect the, 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 um, the, the study at all? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And the second question, just really quickly, um, also is 
Um, how is it that ego dissolution, did you measure that quantitatively? Because that was shown quantitatively on a graph. Thank you. So I didn't get the last question. Oh, how, how is it that you measure uh, something like ego dissolution quantitatively? Oh, okay. So uh, the ego dissolution is just the one item from the 5D AST scale. Kind of, I feel uh, that uh, the border between my surrounding was was kind of loosening, and it's one one sentence from this questionnaire that was used by us, but also by other groups as the ego dissolution item. You could could say. I mean, you can phrase it differently, but you would probably get similar outcome. But of course, it's a very simple. And you saw we we are doing very simple things, right? So. Uh, Good drug effect, bad drug effect, ego dissolution, just one item, of course, yeah. Um, you have to, to make it very simple in, in these pharmacological studies. There are also more complex things going on, but th there are other people, smarter people doing this, not me. In, I even in our lab, so yeah, this exists. And then the other the first question, um, I don't have any data on whether psilocin is kind of producing less inter-individual variation or than psilocybin. Uh, I think there has been a little bit of research in the past comparing the two by, by Hossel, Follenweider and, and people, but otherwise I'm not aware of data. Also, there is a lot unclear about psilocybin, so uh, yeah, uh, is it better to, to use psilocin directly? What are the genetic factors? How is it really? There may be MO involved in the breakdown, but also cytochromes. There is, uh, there is a, a conjugation reaction that also terminates partly the, the psilocybin action. The metabolism is not yet well investigated to my knowledge. So there are many open questions in clinical pharmacology with regards to this uh, Substance, luckily, it's interesting uh, to do more research in this field for companies and, of course, also academics. So I guess I stop here and we will have the next speaker. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm.